Now that we've discussed most of the major functions on the exam, it's time to take a look at the final function family that's part of Algebra 2, that is, trigonometric functions. We're going to go over radians and degrees, trig functions, the unit circle, special triangles, identities, inverses, graphs, and parts of trig functions. First, let's start off by identifying the way that we measure angles, that is, radians and degrees. These equations are both in your reference table, so you don't need to memorize them, but to go from degrees to radians, simply multiply by pi over 180, and to go from radians to degrees, multiply by 180 over pi. Now, let's get into some real trig. Algebra 2 involves the three primary trig functions, that is sine, cosine, and tangent, as well as the reciprocals, that is cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Alright, these are a little bit less common, but you still need to memorize all of these functions. Again, most of this trig unit is memorization. Now, since sine theta is defined as y over r, cos theta is x over r, and tan theta is y over r, they can also be called opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, and opposite over adjacent, respectively. This can be memorized as so toa. You may have heard this acronym before. The reciprocals are of course the exact same thing, but reciprocal. r over y, r over x, and x over y. Now, if that sounded confusing, let's look at an example triangle right here. Here, let's focus on this orange angle right here first. This here is the side adjacent to the angle that is not the hypotenuse. Again, the longest side is of course always the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always the longest side. And again, this also has to be a right triangle. Triangle. We are looking at right angle um, trigonometry only in algebra 2. Now, we have the hypotenuse, we have the adjacent, that means that the last side must be the opposite angle. All right, it's also opposite from the angle. We see it's not touching these two sides are touching the angle, this side is not touching the angle. Now if we're to focus on this blue angle here, that means that this side becomes the opposite because this side is opposite from the blue angle, while this one becomes adjacent because this one is next to the adjacent, and the hypotenuse of course stays the same. Now let's see how our trig functions like this can relate when we have some real numbers involved, that is with special triangles. The two special triangles, that is triangles with common angles like 30 degrees, 6 degrees, and 45 degrees are the 2 square root 3, 1 and the square root 2, 1, 1 triangle. Let's look at the first one right here. Alright, if we wanted to find sine of 30 degrees, which is the same thing as saying sine of pi over 6, right, we're going to go to the 30 degree angle, which we have right here, and then after we do that, we're going to find the opposite side in the hypotenuse. Alright, which one's the hypotenuse? It's obviously going to be this one. Which one's the opposite? It's going to be this one, right? We know the hypotenuse side is the longest, of course, and the opposite one's just opposite the 30 degree angle. So since we know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, we're going to have our opposite, which is 1, over our hypotenuse, which is 2. That means it's 1 half. If we do this for the other triangle, let's say we wanted to find sine of 45 degrees, we're going to focus on our 45 degree angle. We have our opposite, we have our hypotenuse, so it's 1 over square root of 2. If we want to radicalize this denominator, which we learned in a previous unit, we simply multiply both the top and the bottom of the fraction by square root of 2. Obviously, square root 2 times square root of 2 is simply 2, and the top becomes square root of 2. Alright, we're going to get into what these y's, x's, and r's that I mentioned up here mean in a moment, but for now, make sure that you have these triangles memorized. These special triangles have to be memorized so that you know what those values are. And you can use your calculator to find the sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, or cotangent of any angle, but it'll spit out a decimal, and sometimes the question will ask for the answer in exact form, like this over here, this square 2 over 2, which your calculator will not give you. It'll just give you, again, another decimal. And these angles, 30, 60, and 45, are the only ones you're ever going to need to know exact values for. You know, with other angles, you can use your calculator, but if you're asked for an exact value, you have to provide it like this with a square root in there and your calculator will not do that for you. Now let's take a look at some identities. But these are basically just facts about trig equations. First we have that sine is 1 over cosecant and this makes sense since they're reciprocals. Therefore these relationships carry on for the other five trig functions as we see here. Now tangent cotangent has some other special properties. Tan theta is equal to sine theta over cos theta and cotangent theta is equal to cosine theta over sine theta. I have a little proof below to show each one. You can just take a look at that and pause the video if you need to. We also have the Pythagorean identities. You may remember Pythagoras, Pythagoras for the, from the um, Pythagorean theorem, but these are his identities. Now you just need to memorize that these are true, right? You need to memorize that these are true, and they may pop up in the exam, they probably will not. But for example, a question might ask you, say, what's the value of cosine squared theta? and it'll give you the value of sine squared theta. Well, you just plug this value in here, you use this, and then you find 
this algebraically very simply. All right, and now you still may be wondering where did all that x, y, and r stuff come from? Let's regroup and take a look at that again. All right, we're going to look at a circle, which may be weird since you thought we were talking about triangles, but specifically we're going to be talking about a unit circle. And what that means is that the radius of the circle is equal to one unit. One unit. All right, let's do, let's do a little bit of a deep dive into what that's going to mean for us. If we draw a radius, or several as I have here, all of these lines here, they're all radii. Right, if we draw one of these radiuses, what we're going to see is that we have a triangle that's made between the y-axis, the x-axis, let me draw the illustrator, the y-axis, the x-axis, and the unit circle. All right, and this is a radius. Now the radius is of course going to be the hypotenuse of this triangle. Right, it's the longest side, of course. Okay, but how do we know where to draw these triangles and how does this really help us? Well, here I've marked a bunch of different angles in both radians and degrees. If I wanted to find sine of 30 degrees or pi over 6, it would be pretty simple. All right, we're just going to find the degree, so this theta, right? So we're, let's say that this angle here is our 30 degrees, right? That's 30 degrees. Now, when we have that 30 degrees, we're just going to use the y value of this point where we intersect and the x value. So this is some point, right? This is some point x, y, right? And what we're going to use is that this is y and this is x, right? And then this is 1. Now we know that if we wanted to find the sine of 30, we're just going to do the opposite, which in this case is y over the hypotenuse, which is r or 1. This is where y over r comes from. But we know what this y is, right? We know this from our special triangles, that this y is just going to be 1, and then that would be 2. Of course, we have our radius as, a ha as 1 here, so this would really be a half. So what we should get then would be, um, in this case, we would get 0 0.5 over 1, which is equal to 1 over 2. Now, let's think about what, we would hap what would happen if we were given the sine of some value, but you did not know the angle. In that case, we would use the inverse trigonometry functions, which are arc sine, which is also written in this type of notation, arc cosine, and arc tangent. Let's see what I mean here. Let's say we're given that sine of x is equal to 1 half. We're going to use our inverse trig function. See that we had the little negative 1 kind of thing up there? And we're going to basically swap it. So we put the 1 half here, we put the x here. All right. Now we're going to have arc sine of 1 half is equal to x, and we saw before this was 30. But if you put this into your calculator, it would give you this value, this to be 30, if you were in degree mode. If you were in radian mode, it would give you a different answer, give you pi over 6. I also included some graphs of the functions. These all have restricted domains and ranges because, as we mentioned in a previous unit, inverse functions must be one-to-one -one functions, and normally trig functions are not one-to-one, -one, as we saw earlier. But they are one-to-one -one if we only draw them for a certain domain. And to sides up a little bit, here's how we might draw an angle. This is really the proper way. We have the initial side here. We have the reference angle here, and we have the terminal side here. Remember that if you're trying to find the arc sine or arc cotangent or tangent or whatever of another thing, you may need to add or play with the angle to figure out exactly what quadrant you're supposed to be in or what quadrant you're finding in. Because these are restricted to different quadrants, right? you may need to find the angle in one quadrant, say this quadrant here, and then add 90 degrees, right? Because if we find the angle here, we find the angle here, these are the same angle, but we would need to subtract this from 180 to get what this angle is. Now, if that sounded a little bit confusing, make sure to go back to look at your notes. Again, this is a unit review video, so you probably should already know how to do this. If you don't, make sure to check out our topic videos or go back and look at your notes. Now let's move on to what an actual trig equation would look like. The three common ones that you'll see come in this format here. We have y equals a sine or cosine or tangent or whatever of b2 minus times x minus c plus d. All right. Now a is the amplitude, which is one half times um, the max value, y value minus the minimum y value, absolute value of that b1 is the trig function used, b2 is the frequency, a note that also the period is 2 pi over the frequency. c is the horizontal shift, with a positive c being a right shift and a negative c being a left shift, and d is the vertical shift with positive being up and negative being down. Alright, now to end the video, let's look at this function up top to see if we can 
determine what its equation is. And first we clearly see that this is a sine function. Even if we didn't see this sine function down here, we should be able to recognize what a sine function looks like. Remember sine starts at zero and it kind of goes up and then down and then it goes again. Whereas cosine will start at one and then go down. Tangent looks completely different and that should be pretty easy to recognize. Anyhow, we can see in our unit circle relate some concepts here. We can see in our unit circle that these functions are going to match up with the unit circle. So let's say at zero, right? Cosine is, or x is at its maximum value. It's at one over one, right? Because there's no triangle formed. It's just a line. It's at one over one. And that's at zero or two pi. And we see over here in this graph that at zero and at two pi, cosine is at its maximum value. Likewise, sine of x is at its maximum value at pi over two. And if we go over back and we look at our unit circle, it's at its maximum value at pi over two, where y over r is just one over one, right? Anyway, we know that it's sine x. Now our amplitude is gonna be one half times the absolute value of the max minus the min value. The thing between those two is going to be the midline. So this right here is our line, we're gonna call it the midline between the two. All right, cause this is our min, this is our max. And we can see, what is our amplitude? Well, we're going to go one, two, three up. So our amplitude is three. And again, another way you could calculate that is one half times the absolute value of eight minus two, which of course is one half times six, which is three. All right. Now, the next thing we have here is the frequency. In these two pies, we are completing, it looks like two cycles. So that means our frequency is going to be two. Now the horizontal shift is in, it's very interesting. It looks like we are shift pi over two to the right because when we are at zero here, we're going down instead of up. Where we should be is right here if there was no horizontal shift. That means we went pi over two, right? We went pi over two to the right. Therefore, right, because we went this way. So that's our, um, that is our horizontal shift. And finally, our vertical shift, it looks like we're five above the x-axis, so that means our vertical shift is five. And given this equation, that means you can write our amplitude is three, function is sine, right, times two, which is our frequency, times x minus our horizontal shift, which is pi over two, plus five, which is our vertical shift.